All right, and we are back. Happy uh, Wednesday, August 5th here. We're in the middle of chapter 27. We will be finishing that today, carbohydrates. So homework 12 uh, will be due tonight. Quiz nine coming up also on Friday. Um, also coming up on Friday, we're starting the last chapter. Yay! Usually there's a big roar of applause in the live audience, but... <laughs> Um, you can applaud if you want to, but uh, yeah, lipids, uh, chapter 28 will start on Friday. And we'll probably just spend uh, an hour, maybe a little bit into the second hour on lipids, not much. Then we'll do a little bit on metabolism. We'll show you in glycolysis and citric acid cycle where the different reactions correspond. But obviously, we're not going through that, those topics in any amount of detail. And then uh, Monday... We'll be reviewing for the final, and you'll uh, start test four. So that will be over chapters 26 and 28, and a couple topics as they relate to the reactions we've been covering from metabolism. So those things can be uh, on our midterm here. And then Wednesday, next Wednesday, believe it or not, is the final. Um, so yeah, we've got 100 points still to go here on test four and 200 on the final. So what do you see? We have half of the points for this course still available right here in the last week. So definitely the points are backloaded and uh, this rewards the students who persevere and master the material in its entirety over the whole uh, year, you could say, because again, the final is cumulative that way. Homework book challenge is a good time to make sure you're caught up on that. You will certify your completion of that on the final. And I'll, I'll say more about that uh, coming up. I think that's it on announcements. Quite a few, though, to keep track of. Oh, also on Learning Suite, make sure you check all your scores. Make sure we have everything entered correctly. If not, shoot me an email, and we can, uh, we can make sure that that's taken care of. All right, to review what we did on, uh, on Monday here, we started Sugars. So here's a little review for this. If, if you want to pause your video, you can and work on this. Uh, so you got to draw a couple things, do a couple reactions. Glucose, mannose, galactose, and then name this one, and then uh, show the, uh, the structure of it in its furanose form. Okay. So we're back. Let's look at this. Alpha glucose. So most of the time, 99% of the time exists as the chair, pyranose form, the hemiacetal. And we want the alpha form. So we need this guy, what? Down. Beta would be up, equatorial. This is axial or down. And then all the other stereocenters, C6 position is the primary position. Then all the others are equatorial around the ring. So there's alpha glucose. And we can react it with methanol and acid, and we can get the methyl uh, glycoside, it's called. And we only put the methyl ether at that position. Notice that becomes an acetal now. We do not put the ethers at all the other hydroxyl positions. Why? Because this is only a place where we can form the carbocation upon protonation because we get the extra resonance structure at this anomeric carbon, remember. Now, if we use excess methyl iodide and base, we can either use silver oxide as a base or we can use sodium hydride as a base. Then we'll put the methyl ethers everywhere, okay? We'll have that methyl ether, that one, this one. We'll do a global methylation, you could say. <laughs> of that. So each one of these hydroxyls became a methyl ether. And that's because we deprotonate, form O minus, and then add there. Uh, let's see, up here when we form the methyl glycoside under acidic conditions with methanol, I'm showing the alpha, but there's also the beta anomer that's formed there, because the methanol can attack the top or the bottom. Same thing here. Um, actually, when you deprotonate here, you can go back to the aldehyde and O minus here but that can snap shut either alpha or beta ways and give you uh, alpha, as we show here, plus beta, okay? Now, you can take this one here, the polymethyl ether, and if you react that with acid and water, so here's a bonus reaction for you, you can hydrolyze at the anomeric position, but not these methyl ethers. These are stable. Why can we hydrolyze this? Well, this is an acetal, and the acetal can be hydrolyzed, 
back there to the hydroxyl group at that position. So that's just protonating here, back to the carbocation, and then trapped with water, top or bottom. But look, the methyl ethers all stay in place, okay? So there we've got all the different products, right? We've got methyl ether just at the anomeric spot, methyl ether everywhere, and then methyl ethers everywhere here except the anomeric position. So you see the versatility of these uh, reactions here. All right, mannose, let's see. It's very similar to glucose. In fact, there's only one difference. There's alpha mannose. Mannose compared to glucose is what? We need to switch this stereocenter at the two position. We say it's epimeric, okay? Or stereoisomeric at the two position. But the others are the same, equatorial, equatorial, equatorial. And these are the D sugars. So this last one in the back is up, right? That's the R stereocenter right there and there. So where's this hydroxyl here compared to glucose? Well, instead of being equatorial, it's actually axial. Okay, so there's alpha mannose. Okay, that looks kind of funny, but that position's now axial. Okay, we say it's what? Epimeric uh, or diastereomeric compared to glucose. It's still D sugar. So that last stereocenter is in the, in the uh, up position. How about galactose? We've got similar relationship to glucose. And let's see, oh, we're asked to draw the beta form. <laughs> So beta is up right there. Two positions the same, equatorial. Three positions also equatorial. But at the four position now, we have something different here compared to, to glucose. So at the four position now, we have it axial up position. Okay. You can go back to the Fisher projection and relate it to that. Glucose is what? In the open uh, Fisher projection is right, left, right, right. Mannose is left, left, right, right. And galactose is what? right, left, left, right, <laughs> okay. So I remember those patterns just based off of glucose where everything's equatorial uh, and then mannose epimeric at the two position and galactose epimeric at the four position. Of course, you have to keep track of alpha and beta anomers, okay. All right, name this one. Let's see, we've got how many carbons? One, two, three, four, five. Oh, so it's a pentose. It's not a hexose like the three we've just been looking at. Which one is this? Look, they're all on the right side. Which one is that? That's the only pentose I expect you to name. And it's important because it's in DNA and RNA. So which one is it? Yeah, ribose, okay? Ribose, and I remember that because they're all on the right, okay? And let's see the furanose form. If you tip it on its side and then cyclize around, what is it gonna be? It's gonna have the up position there, uh, and then what? Down, down, and you're asked to draw the alpha one, which would be what? With this up, okay? So there's the one position. Here's the two position you see down, three position down. And look, it's the four position that cyclizes over, and it is a furanose. It's a uh, five-membered ring. And that's what you're familiar with probably in DNA, RNA, and we'll get to that today where you switch that out for a heterocyclic base, A, T, G, or C. And then in DNA, you switch this out for a hydrogen. It's deoxy at that position. So ribose is an important one uh, to keep track of. Furanose form, could we draw the pyranose form of that? We just cyclized right now here to form the uh, five-membered ring. We could do a pyranose form of ribose right there. We'd have to draw this alcohol then as being the one adding to the anomeric position. Uh, some people often ask, well, here are pyranose forms of the hexoses. Can we have furanose forms? Yeah, that hydroxyl can also attack over here and form the five-membered ring. But the hexoses is much more common to have the uh, pyranose the uh, six ring form, okay? So a lot of structural issues there, a lot of things to keep track of, and then we add in some of these mechanisms, okay? So yeah, hang in there on keeping track of that. Let's go to the overhead screen now. We've shown you this chart already. No, you don't memorize the whole chart, but know the principles of it. So a triose here means what? Three carbons, and there is D-glyceraldehyde, and that is one you need to know. 
be able to go from the name to the structure, structure to the name, okay? It's D, why? Because the stereocenter right here, the last one, the only one, is to the right. The two tetroses, I've shown those, and we went through the Fisher uh, synthesis of those uh, to show you how the uh, stereochemistry, the symmetry, optical rotations were determined there, threos and, and erythros erith erith and threos, yeah. You don't need to know those specific names, okay? I'm trying to limit this. Ribose, though, you do need to know. We go into the pentose series, and there's ribose all on the right side. Uh, arabinose is quite common in gum, uh, Arabic gums, uh, different plants have that. Xylose is in wood fibers. Lexose is far less common, I think. And then the hexose is here. By far, here's the big guy. Over 90% of carbon on Earth is tied up as glucose. And there it is, right, left, right, right. And these Fisher projections are good. You can see the uh, stereochemical relationships very clearly here. What's the other one you need to know? Oh, mannose, there it is. The two position, it's epimeric, you say. Uh, with glucose. Just switch it over. All three of the other stereocenters here below are the same as glucose. And then what was the other one? Oh, galactose. There we are. So right, left, left, right. Yep. And yeah, the others are uh, far less common and kind of uh, scary names, I think. Gulose, the real scary sugar. Yeah, don't memorize that one. Okay. Uh, but yeah, what did we say? Mannose, galactose, glucose, ribose, and glyceraldehyde. I think that's enough for you. And here's the uh, the graphic talking about the cyclization and keeping track of the stereocenters. And we'll review that with the physical model here in a second, but you should be able to see that relationship tipping this on its side and then cyclizing over here with the red hydroxyl group. That's the one at the, at the five position. And you gotta rotate around that bond between four and five. You see that puckers this primary alcohol up. That's the six position, right? And then you form the hemiacetal right there, either uh, beta with that up or alpha down. We went through that last time, so that's hopefully a review, but make sure you physically go through that. Okay, sugars are sweet. Saccharides, that's what the name implies. Sucrose is a disaccharide. Table sugar, we'll get to that today. It's a disaccharide. You can see glucose here and fructose. We did do fructose last time. There are artificial sweeteners maybe you've heard about. Uh, NutraSweet, Aspartame, and Sucralose, Splenda are probably the common ones now. Uh, Aspartame's uh, 180 times sweeter than sucrose. And I don't know how they determine that. That's kind of an arbitrary thing. <laughs> they have tasters who come in and, and rank these things, whatever. But Sucralose or Splenda is 1,000 times sweeter than sucrose. And you see it's got three uh, chlorides on it. And, and don't memorize that either. Uh, but they just treat sucrose with HCl for a given amount of time, and it does the uh, halogenation, the chlorination of alcohols, which is a 351 reaction via the carbocations. And they, they need to limit the time. If they let it go for longer, you'll hydrolyze the acetal. Okay, So that's a specialized type of reaction. Currently, the world's sweetest known compound is sucrononic acid, 200,000 times sweeter than sucrose. And what's the point of using artificial sweeteners? Yeah, you lower the caloric co uh, load within the food so the, the uh, uh, people don't get the same uh, amount of, of nutrients that way, but they get the same sweet taste, okay? So the amount of spartame or sucralose can be tiny amounts in a food product, whereas you'd need uh, quite a bit, gram amounts of sucrose, okay? So... That's, that's the basis of that anyway. Uh, starch and cellulose, we'll get to this today. We'll come back to this and look at the uh, structures there. But uh, cellulose, that's not food. That's woody fiber or roughage. Starch, this is uh, amulose or uh, amylopectin. And uh, they have different, different stereocenter relationships here. These are just polymers of glucose, both of them. Cellulose is beta-linked, okay, with this up to form the acetal linkage between the two sugars. And starch is down, or alpha, okay? So there's specific enzymes that digest these things. Uh, in higher animals, we have uh, amylases, glycosidases, that are specific for the alpha linkage form. That's why starch for us is food, whereas cellulose is not. We do not have cellulases in our bodies. So there are organisms that can digest cellulose, 
Uh, and you, you probably have heard of some of those. Uh, fungi and termites uh, have cellulase. And there's a lot of industrial research on creating better cellulases to hydrolyze cellulose more efficiently and liberate more glucose. That, that's a very, uh, very important goal industrially. In fact, if you want to win a Nobel Prize or earn millions or billions of dollars, come up with a new better cellulase enzyme uh, that can catalyze the decomposition of cellulose efficiently. Normally we would waste most of the cellulose. We just harvest the starch granule, for example, ethanol coming out of corn. It's all through the starch. And then we uh, digest the starch uh, with yeast into ethanol. And that's the fuel that we get out there. But if we could use the whole plant, the cellulose part, it could be much more efficient. Well, I guess so we'll get back to that. Let's go to the board now and look at disaccharides and what we need to know here. So disaccharides, we're putting another sugar on the anomeric position. And glycosides in general uh, mean we just have something on the side. Okay, so glyco meaning sugar and side, something on the side of the sugar. So here's our basic structure for our sugar, but let's put something else there. And that's our group's going to be another sugar. Well, are there other types of glycosides? Can we put other things there? Yeah, we can actually put chlorides there. Okay, uh, we can put phosphates there. In fact, that's how nature will make uh, a lot of these structures. So you can have different things there. You can actually have sulfur there, different uh, sulfide glycosides. You can also have, um, uh, let's see, what else? We can have um, uh, cyanides. <laughs> uh, some of those are known in nature too. Let's see, there's one other I think I needed to point out to you. Which one was it? Uh, oh, yeah, the real important one. And that's the uh, nitrogens there. So in DNA and RNA, we have the bases. What A, T, G, and C, we have those there. And those are nitrogen glycosides. Okay, so this can be quite diverse. What we're going to look at first are just the uh, sugar ones where we have a, another sugar on the side. So let's see here. Let's take starch first, and let's just treat it with acid for a given amount of time. And it's going to begin to break down and hydrolyze that. You have to add quite a bit of acid and, and heat this up to get it to go, and it actually gives a real mixture of things. But one of the things it gives is maltose. And maltose is two sugars uh, linked together, glucose two of them, and they're linked alpha 1, 4 to each other. Now, that shouldn't be a surprise because starch, I'm already showing you, is uh, alpha linked. It has the down position. So we're hydrolyzing a bunch of positions within the starch polymer, and one of the key products is called maltose. Okay, It's ose. It's still a sugar here. And what does it look like? Well, we got one glucose on there. There we go. And... Let's see, at the one position, which is right here, it's what? Down or alpha. And then we have the other sugar linked right here, right? We've got the other glucose molecule right here. And let's see. Then we have what? A, uh, uh, a linkage here at the four position, okay? And that's where the 4-hydroxyl is, right, coming off there. And so that's why we say alpha 1,4 link. Alpha refers to the anomeric position here. That can be alpha or beta. But this is from starch, so it's alpha you see right there. And the 4 position, that stereocenter is fixed right there. But what do you say? That linkage right there is a full acetal. But what about this position here? This can be alpha, as I've shown, but that's a hemiacetal, right? That would be in equilibrium with what? The free aldehyde and the alcohol here. I'm not drawing the rest of the molecule here, but this equilibrium right here at the one position, this hydroxyl coming off at the, at the five position uh, can be an alcohol aldehyde. Why? Because this is a hemiacetal here. Okay. 
What this means name-wise, maltose means it's glucose, glucose linked one, four, one position of the one to the four position of the other with the alpha stereocenter. But it doesn't refer to this, okay? This can be in equilibrium with the open form and then it can cyclize to give the beta form. So when you take maltose and analyze it, let's see, let's do the Tollens test, okay? If we take maltose, this disaccharide, and treat it with the silver oxide ammonia base, will it give the silver mirror? Yes, because what? The free aldehyde is here. So the Tollens test will be positive. We say then it is a reducing sugar. Okay, what about mutarotation? Well, it mutarotate, if we take pure alpha or pure beta and put it in solution and watch it in the polarimeter, Will the optical rotations change? Yes, they will. So it is mutarotating because it's a hemiacetal still, okay? This position stays fixed. In order to break this apart and make two glucoses, you have to treat it with strong acid still, heat it up, and then you can get the two glucoses to come off, okay? And we'll talk about that mechanism, but you should see how to do that. That's just the acetal linkage there, okay? But it's mutarotating, and it is positive for the tollens because this disaccharide has the uh, hemiacetal form. Okay, that's maltose. Let's look at another one here. How about if we take cellulose? And we'll partially hydrolyze that also. And this, this is harder to do because <laughs> this is in the uh, beta linkage position. Uh, but you can do it. You can do it enzymatically, whatever. And you can get, again, a, a, a di-glucose uh, molecule, okay, a disaccharide with two sugars on there. And it's going to be called cellobios now. And cellobios is linked uh, beta. One, four. So it's really the same thing as maltose, except cellobios is going to be beta link between the, but also at the four positions. So let's see what it would look like. We'd have this, okay, and everything the same. So that's glucose. You can verify that that's glucose. But now look, it's beta linked right here, okay? So it's going to be different, right? And then this is linked to the other glucose molecule right here. So that's still glucose, still equatorial everywhere. But look at our linkage here. Here's the one position. Here's the four position. And what? That is indeed up, right? So that's beta. That's the key thing. It's still an acetal. You can look at that part of the structure. Ah, but what about over here? <laughs> yeah, it can be a mixture of alpha and beta. Let's draw beta, okay, plus alpha. Okay, that's in equilibrium with the free aldehyde. Why? Because that's a hemiacetal, okay? Just like before. So we have an acetal linking here at the one-four position, but we have a free anomeric OH. We have a hemiacetal there, which means what? Tollens test? What is it? Well, yes, it's going to be positive. Why? Because that aldehyde can get oxidized, right? <laughs> so it will make the silver mirror. What about uh, meter rotation? Will it meter rotate? If you take the pure alpha or pure beta form here, and referring to this position here, this is linked. If this is linked one four beta, this has this is cellobios, okay? We're not talking about that, but this is in equilibrium with the free aldehyde at this spot. And so if you take pure alpha or beta, it can what? Equilibrate. It can form the two and give a mixture. And from the pure alpha or pure beta, which have rotations, I'm not showing you those optical rotations, but if you put them back in solution, it will mutarotate, okay? So it is a reducing sugar and it is mutarotating, but it's very different. <laughs> uh, this is not food, okay? We can't digest this. In our bodies, we don't have the enzyme that recognizes the beta stereocenter, but we do have the one for maltose that is food for us because it's uh, alpha. Okay, questions on that? Um, yeah, the structures and everything should be okay there. Let's look at uh, lactose now. So another disaccharide, lactose or milk sugar. Milk sugar uh, is a little bit different now. It's going to be galactose, glucose, and let's see, it's going to be beta 
uh, one four linked. Ah, so now we have a different monosaccharide here. We have a similar type of, of linkage here. And so let's see, in milk sugar, uh, mammals produce this. And let's see, so we've got to have uh, uh, galactose here on this side. So D sugar, so that stereocenter is the same, but what is galactose again? Right, it's that up position right here. It's axial at this four position, right? And then it's equatorial, equatorial here, just like before. And now we got to draw the linkage to the other glucose molecule. And what do we need? We need beta. <laughs> so what is it? Yeah, it's it's up right here. And so we got this, and then we can go out to our other sugar, which is glucose. Okay, and you see equatorial, equatorial there, and that is the four position, one position that is indeed beta. That makes it lactose. That's the name for this sugar now, okay? We're showing you the substructures of what it is to keep track of it. But the names here that we've done, maltose, cellulose, and lactose now, refer to the disaccharide and the specific linkage here, okay? Milk sugar uh, can be alpha or beta. Let's see, let's draw alpha, okay? So this is in the down position. So we're showing alpha lactose here. Uh, it's because it's a hemiacetal, it is in equilibrium with the beta. And so we can ask those same questions. Tollens test, will it be positive? Yes, because it is a hemiacetal, free aldehyde. At that spot, not here, okay? To hydrolyze that, I'll tell you how to do that in a second. But Muter rotating, yep, because of the hemiacetal, also positive. These things normally go together. Okay, we'll say a little bit more on sucrose coming up where, where there'll be a little bit of a, a different issue here. But uh, yeah, that's the key thing there uh, for that. Um, maybe you've heard of lactose intolerance, and that's because uh, you need to have an enzyme called lactase in order to use lactose as a, as a food uh, product. So the lactase enzyme hydrolyzes this into a molecule of, of, of glucose and a molecule of galactose, and then those can be metabolized. But there are some people who uh, don't have this enzyme or the gene for this enzyme, lactase, goes away later on. Mainly people in Asia and in Southern Europe, um, generally they lose the ability to produce the lactase enzyme later in life. And they can't tolerate a lot of dairy products. So if they eat too much cheese or milk, they'll have a problem there. The lacto lactose disaccharide will pass into their, their gastrointestinal tract, and then the bacteria will feed on it. Uh, and that can create a lot of discomfort, whatever. So it's not a life-threatening condition, but lactose intolerance can be treated easily. There are lactase pills that, that people can take, or they limit the dairy, whatever. So how does lactase work? Well, we can say it's an enzyme, and it has a protonated base within that enzyme, and you can use that to uh, protonate uh, this position here, which is what, on the acetal position? That will give an intermediate that what looks like this. Um, and I won't draw the whole sugars there, but once you protonate the acetal oxygen of the linkage there, Look, you can break this bond and form the carbocation there, which is what? Stabilized by the pair of electrons on the pyran, right? And so what does that give you? Gives you this uh, stabilized uh, carbocation with the charge on oxygen now. And it gives you the free uh, sugar here on the right side. So coming off here from lactose, this would be a molecule of what? Glucose <laughs> right here. Now, how do we get to the galactose? Okay, the other product here from lactase. Well, we have to add water, right? If we add water there, we can then get to galactose. Add water, and then we have to lose the proton off there, and the enzyme can handle that. This is the enzyme right here, uh, lactase, doing that hydrolysis of the glycoside linkage. So there are enzymes for the other ones we just talked about. There's maltase. Uh, and there's uh, cellobiase, okay? But this is lactase, and the mechanisms are all very similar, except they're different structures that are recognized by the 
by the enzymes. This substrate here, the entire thing, has to fit within a pocket of the enzyme and then come in proximity with this uh, general acid here and get protonated there. And then you see that weakens the linkage and allows for cleavage and then incorporation of water. So it is a hydrolase enzyme. It's using water to what? Break a bond there. But yeah, the disaccharides there. Let's look at the uh, next one, which is sucrose. And sucrose table sugar. We all know and love this uh, compound. <laughs> and what is it? Sucrose. So we've got sucrose, and it's alpha, beta, 1, 2 linked glucose plus fructose. <laughs> So it's a little more complicated. We have the one position, which is the anomeric position of glucose, and the two position is actually the anomeric position of fructose. And coming off the glucose, it's alpha. Coming off the fructose, it's beta. So this is a little more complicated. And remember, the structure of fructose is more complicated. Why? Because it's not an aldose. It's what? A ketose. That's right. It's a ketone at that two position. So the structure is going to be a little bit more complicated. Let's see. Let's draw the glucose one first. And there are different ways to draw the, the sugars. I'm just rotating it around a little bit. It's still all equatorial groups coming off here, uh, the OH group. I just wanted to, to get it a little bit out of the way there. But... You, the other orientation we've seen, but but the oxygen of the pyran is still in the upper right part, and this is still up this position here. So you can see it's still D glucose, and let's see at the one position we have it down or alpha, okay, and that's the linkage then to uh, the to the fructose, and there are different ways to draw the fructose too. I'll kind of pucker it up here, and. Oh, will identify the group. So this is the one position and the two position coming off the anomeric position out of the ketone. You see two oxygens on it, so that's where the ketone was. Just like here, here's where the aldehyde was. Why do we call this a ketone now? Because it's got two carbons on the side of it, right? But it is indeed a full acetal <laughs> everywhere. In fact, you could say it's two acetals. One acetal right here, including glucose going through there, and then another acetal right there through the, uh, through the uh, fructose part. And then there are two more stereocenters. One's up right there. One is down right there. And this one is uh, up right there. So, yeah, I kind of reoriented this one. This is coming out at you uh, if you want to make a model of it and examine it more carefully. But, uh, yeah, you should be able to see the two position. This is what the five position and the six position over there. So this is indeed the anomeric position that's linked there. Now, the, the key thing to look at here is uh, the Tollens test and also meter rotating. Okay, because now what, what do we have here? We've got, um, we've got the issue of uh, is there a free aldehyde present, right? Uh, and if you look at it, no, there's no aldehyde here. This is just part of the ether over there. This isn't the uh, a carbon with with a hemiacetal, and this is not a hemiacetal. There's an ether ether here, right? Uh, the alcohol is one carbon away at the one position. Same thing here, ether ether, and no hemiacetal. Okay, so we should be able to examine that and then predict whether it's going to be positive in the Tollens test or meter rotating. And let's see, the optical rotation of sucrose is uh, plus 66.3. And when you put it in the polarimeter and let it go for a long time here, it stays right at 66.3. So is it meter rotating? No. And why not? There's no hemiacetal. There's no free aldehyde. Okay. It's tied up as an acetal, acetal linkage here. Both anomeric positions are diethers. There's no ether hydroxyl on that carbon. So it's negative for the meter rotation. What about Tollens test? Yeah, there's no free aldehyde to get oxidized. 
So the silver mirror will not be produced. So sucrose, we say, is negative for the tollens and not mutarotating. So it's not a reducing sugar, not mutarotating. Why? Because of the two acetal uh, linkages here. So it is unique that way. It's in a number of plants. We get it mainly from uh, sugar beets and corn and, uh, oh, what's the other one? From uh, canes, from sugar cane, yeah. So it can be obtained in a number of places. Um, but uh, yeah, table sugar there. And you can make syrups out of it, you know, with different amounts of water and uh, heating it up, you can get it to uh, form different uh, different types of things there for uh, for food products. But yeah, the basics of it is here that it's that it's a different type of structure, right? Acetal, acetal linked uh, there. Okay, like I said, look at the models and make sure you're uh, okay with that. In fact, we could review that a little bit right now. Let's look back at our model here and, and see. So um, I've got, uh, you know, the, the structure here, and we'll, we'll re review this right, left, right, right thing. <laughs> and which one is that again? Well, that's glucose, okay? So my hand is where the uh, aldehyde is up at the top. And here's the two position and looking down at it right there. This is to the right. C3 is to the left. Okay, right there, you see it to the left. C4, and you always have to have the other carbons uh, back in the, the, the vertical plane. Those are kinked back. You have know, the hydrogen here. I'm, I'm not showing the hydrogens on my model, I'm just showing the hydroxyls where the oxygen are. That's to the right, right there. And then the last one here, yep, to the right. And that's a special one. That lone pair I've got is yellow because that's going to form what? Our cyclic form. Okay. And so let's attack our aldehyde here. And we can attack from either the top or the bottom there to give alpha or beta. And let's see, which one did we form here? Well, we've got to get things in the right chair. <laughs> uh, yeah, so there it would be, the right chair for for uh, glucose right there, and we have the alpha one, yeah, being formed there. Equatorial, 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 and equatorial back there. Yeah, so make sure you can go through that and keep it straight. And the orientation's important, I think, you know, for the monosaccharides, make sure you have the oxygen in the upper right position. Then you can always see whether it's D or not, right? Then you can clearly see alpha down and beta uh, up there. Oh, one thing we didn't verify here on sucrose, we need the beta linkage here for the fructose, right? And so this could either be up or down at the Santa Maria position. Look, it's up relative to the last stereo center here. So indeed it is what beta right there. You can verify that. And it has to be alpha beta one, two linked there with uh, glucose and fructose. But now we call that whole thing sucrose, okay? The name sucrose means this whole structure right here. Okay, very good. Let's see what else. I can review a couple of reactions here. Um, yeah, let, let me show you the synthesis now of 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 sugars, polysaccharides, and and just a little bit on it. Um, not much, but let's let's show you. You know, you got one sugar here and you got your alcohol, and you got, you know, all the other stuff here. I'm not going to draw the rest of them on there. But you actually form a, a phosphate here, okay? And it's actually uh, uracil uh, triphosphate <laughs> that does this. And we'll, we'll see uracil here the second hour. And, and what does that do? Well, it puts a phosphate on that position. And, and we'll just stick with a monophosphate right now. And actually in the biosynthesis of sugars, often puts on a diphosphate with the uracil still there. But I think it's okay just to focus on the anomeric position here, getting a phosphate on it, okay? So there's an enzyme that does that. It's a phosphorylase of whatever sugar you want. And then this, what, creates a good leaving group, right? We took an alcohol, which is a terrible leaving group on its own. On its own. We've been protonating it. But with the triphosphate here of UTP, you put on a phosphate group there. I'm not going to go through the mechanism of that. But once this becomes a good leaving group, look, you can use the lone pair here to push off, especially if it's in the down position, alpha, 
electronically. That's the anamerica effect that makes it faster that way. And so what do we get? We get the, uh, we get the uh, carbocation, which has a resonance effect with the oxygen there. And then what? We can have another sugar here, okay? So this can be another sugar or a different type of nucleophile, whatever. For sugar, it's an alcohol. And most of them we've been looking at, it's the four position off here that then will link that up, okay? And then you need to lose a proton off this position. But the enzyme does that as well, forming either the alpha, like I'm showing here, or the beta can form if, it, if the enzyme directs it at the top there. Yeah, so that's how the sugar synthesis uh, occurs and makes glycogen and makes all these other polymeric ones we're going to, uh, to look at here. So let's, I think, go back to the board. How are we doing on time? I think we're okay. We have a few minutes. Okay, yeah, we have a few minutes here for our first hour. Let's go to the, uh, the polymers here, starch and cellulose again. I think my mouse shows up okay on your graphic. And you have all these graphics on Learning Suite. And if you want to learn more about it, you know, there's that supplement by McMurray I talked about last time, that green book. I, I talked to a couple people who did go over to the bookstore and, and picked it up. So it is available, but you don't need it. All, all my graphics have everything you need to know. And we're just examining the structures and the stereochemistry. Okay, the key thing you need to know is the stereochemical linkage difference between cellulose and starch. And that should be pretty clear now, right? We got uh, beta anomers and alpha anomers, okay? Equatorial versus axial. Cellulose has the beta, the equatorial. And when it polymerizes, N here can be hundreds or thousands of units. So many glucose come together. These are woody fibers in plants. These fibers are, tend to be extended linear in their nature. And then they can twist around each other in what? Those light blue bonds here. These are many chains, many polyglucose chains in cellulose. And then they can have what? Interchain hydrogen bonds that can rigidify this and make it very, very strong. Starch are softer, uh, kind of powdery looking materials when they're dehydrated coming out of plants. Rice and potatoes, once you take all the water out, it's essentially 100% starch. <laughs> But a little bit different here. Cellulose tends to be linear 1, 4 all the way through its structure. Starch has 1, 4 again here with the alpha linkage, but it also has this right here. What's this one coming off this position? What is that position right there? That's the 6 position. That's that primary alcohol. That creates a branch point within the polyglucose. Okay? This branching can occur quite frequently in plant uh, amylose, amylopectin, or in uh, glycogen in higher animals. And so there are differences there, how many branch points per, per chain. I'm not gonna have you know that. We'll save that for biochemistry later on. But you see the starch thing uh, has a different shape then. It's a softer material, it's kind of powdery. You've all played around with starch probably in pure form. I think you can get it uh, at the market and for, for different applications there. but. Uh, cornstarch, a thickening agent for cooking. There you go. There's, <laughs> there's one you might be familiar with anyway. But uh, yeah, there it is with the different structure. And so it has different appearances and different application. Uh, I don't know how much I want to do on this. This is the blood glucose thing. This is the monosaccharide, of course, glucose in the blood. Uh, the concentrations go up and down depending on when you had your last meal here. <laughs> And the amount of insulin uh, is the regulatory hormone that signals cells to take in glucose. So insulin is produced in response to elevated uh, blood glucose levels after a diet here. Uh, the problem is if you're eating a diet rich in sucrose or in monosaccharides, uh, glucose and fructose are quickly liberated then in the body, and that causes a spike in the amount. So this can go up more rapidly, and then it's metabolized very quickly, and you get this crash late in the afternoon. <laughs> if all you ate for lunch was candy and a can of Coke, <laughs> this is how you're going to feel late in the afternoon, which is low energy levels. Whereas if you're eating a uh, starch-rich diet with polysaccharides or polycarbs, then these are liberated more slowly and blood glucose levels stay more stable throughout the day 
that's an important uh, health uh, condition there. So, yeah, you should be eating uh, a diet rich in polycarbohydrates, not monosaccharides uh, for that difference. A lot of other things we could talk about there, but yeah, I like to show that. Here's a summary of the reactions we've been talking about, forming the methyl glycosides and hydrolyzing there and, you know, forming the cyclic things. We're going to get into this now in the second hour, the uh, nucleotides where we have on deoxyribose, we have a nitrogen uh, glycoside, and then we have a phosphate at that uh, five position. That makes it a nucleotide. They're found in the nucleus of cells, so that's where that term comes from. Here's some more reactions, I think. Yeah, is glucose again. Uh, and then forming the polyether, then hydrolyzing. Yeah, I think we started out with that one. Mixture of alpha and beta at that point. Uh, well, all these points, because you start out with a hemiacetal there. Oh, the polyester, the polyacetate. I think we did that too. Oh, and there's the Tollens test. If you see a hemiacetal, a hydroxy ether on a given carbon that lets you analyze that, you can see that uh, can be... Uh, uh, positive on the Tollens test. Fischer synthesis, there's a review of that reaction too. You add the cyanide to a sugar, you form the next uh, sugar up. So you go from a triose to a tetrose. Mixture of stereocenters at two position because the cyanide can add top or bottom there. And then you partially hydrogenate and then hydrolyze the imine to liberate the free aldehyde at that point. So that's an important thing to keep in mind, the fissure. There's our maltose and our cellobios. We can review that. Here's just the stick figures of those disaccharides. And you can make models of them if your kit has enough atoms there. Maltose, remember, comes from starch. So there you see the alpha linkage from the four position over. So this is glue-glue, right? Both glucose here, but this is uh, beta-linked. So that came from uh, cellulose, yep. Cellobios is the disaccharide. Here's the structure of a starch. It kind of winds around, kind of coils around here, and you see the, the down linkage there. Uh, that's the, uh, that's the uh, linkage coming off the, uh, the sugar there. And so what, which one is this? This is a polysaccharide, a polymer. Is it starch or is it cellulose? Let's see. Ah, examining that. This is the one position. That's indeed equatorial, so it must be from what? Must be from uh, cellulose. Okay, so you can kind of analyze it from. Here's amylopectin out of plants, and uh, glycogen in higher animals. These glycogen particles can be seen with a microscope in higher animals in inside their cells. There's many, many particles of glycogen and uh, many, many branch points. There's more branching here, and every spot here is where there's a one six linkage where one sugar has two groups coming off. The four always is the main chain, and then the, the branch point has a, a six-position linkage. But you see more branch points, which means there's more terminal positions that can be hydrolyzed easily. And, and if you haven't eaten lately, you can still get that energy out of a cell and liberate the glucose, go back into the bloodstream, and go to where it's needed, usually for muscle contraction. Amylopectin in plants has fewer linkages, but don't, don't worry about that. I'm just showing the different branching structures. Oh, here's an application. And maybe, yeah, we're out of time here the first hour. We'll leave this to the next time. So stay tuned for blood types. Most of you know your blood type, A, B, uh, uh, or O, or maybe A, B. Some people have, have both antigens. We'll say a little bit about what an antigen is. Here's an erythrocyte, a blood cell. So this is drawn to scale, but uh, they're proteins that are uh, membrane bound. And at the nitrogen position is what? A uh, glycoside. And then there's these complex uh, polysaccharides we'll say a little bit more about next time. So stay tuned. Let's take a break now, 10-minute break, and we'll be back for a second hour here today.